Welcome everyone to today's associates meeting at the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm Mark Duggan, the Trioni Director of CEPR, and I'm very happy to see all of you here today for our conversation uh, with Jason Furman. Uh, just a few things to tell you uh, before we welcome Jason up here to the podium. Um, I hope that you all had the chance uh, to see a story that we sent out today highlighting some new research by, on the digital divide that was done by Greg Rostin, who will actually be uh, moderating the Q&A with Jason in about a half an hour or so. Uh, and several of our other senior and faculty fellows have also been receiving a lot of attention in the media lately. Uh, just to take a few examples, The Economist just recently shined a light on some work that Amit Saru has done on shadow banking. Uh, Rebecca Diamond uh, has an op-ed in the Boston Globe about rent control, and Vox picked up on Matthew Jenskow's recent work on political polarization. Um, a lot of that research happens thanks <clears throat> to the support of many of you in this room, and I thank you for your, for your commitment to what we're accomplishing here at CEPR. As of today, we have just 38 days from our March 13th CEPR Economic Summit, and I hope to see many of you there. Uh, the lineup is finalized, and we're going to have keynotes from H.R. McMaster, the former National Security Advisor, Melody Hobson from Ariel Investments, and David Malpas, the president of the World Bank. And we're also going to have sessions on 5G technology, tax and inequality, U.S. political economy, and the economics of the arts. Uh, but today, I'm especially excited to have Jason Furman here with us talking about, as he puts it, Taming the Digital Giants and the Decline of Competition. Uh, I first met Jason during President Obama's uh, first term when Jason was the Deputy Director of the National Economic Council and I was a senior economist at the Council of Economic Advisors working on the Affordable Care Act. Uh, Jason continued in the Obama administration long after I wrapped up in 2010 at the National Economic Council and then was chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors from August 2013 to January 2017, playing a major role in most of the biggest economic policy decisions being made by President Obama. Uh, Jason has held a variety of posts in public policy and in research. During the Clinton administration, he worked at both the National Economic Council and the Council of Economic Advisors. He's also worked at the World Bank. He's been a director of uh, the Hamilton Project and a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and also has served in visiting positions at multiple universities, including NYU's Wagner Graduate School of Public Policy. Today, Jason is a professor of the practice of economic policy at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government and in its Department of Economics, and he's also a non-resident senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. His academic interests are very broad, including fiscal policy, tax policy, health economics, social security, technology policy, and domestic and international macroeconomics. He holds a PhD in economics from Harvard, and I'm very grateful that he can spend some time with us here today at CEPR. So please join me in welcoming Jason Furman to CEPR. Uh, thank you, Mark, for um, inviting me. Thanks to everyone to, for coming. Uh, the title of the talk is a tiny bit overwritten in an effort to interest people, and I'll try to nuance it a little bit more um, as all of us talk. Um, this is my second chance uh, to speak in this room. The last time was on the need to reform our corporate tax system, and now that that's perfect, I've, I've moved on um, in, my, in my own interest. As Mark said, I have a range of interests in economic policy. And industrial organization, which is the field of economics that deals with competition, hasn't really been at all one of my core areas. And I'll tell you a little bit about how I got into it, a little bit how I got into this, and then other people in the Q&A can embarrass me for where I go wrong as a result of all of that. Council of Economic Advisors, we were very concerned with the fact that productivity growth was low and that inequality was rising, and that both of these were happening at the same time. And we're looking around for different potential causes of both of these phenomena, and started to document facts about what was going on with concentration in the economy, the number of firms in any given industry. And I should say, just in terms of outline, I'll start with that, that increased concentration that you see in a lot of parts of the economy. Um, and then go from there to segue into, in sort of the order that I followed the issue, 
um, into digital competition, what policy should do, and I'll share with you the recommendations, many of them that the United Kingdom is acting on, of a panel that I chaired for the um, UK government, for the, for the Treasury, um, and then finally some of the next steps. So to start with that increased concentration, um, I won't start with a really new industry, something digital. I'll start with something that's thousands and thousands and thousands of year old, which is beer. Um, there's Budweiser and Heineken. There's a lot of other beers. If you go to the supermarket, there's many, many different varieties of beers. With I don't know what most of those are. I don't drink them. Cabell, Goose, Elysian, and the like. Um, but what all those beers have in common is that half of them are made by one company, Anheuser-Busch InBev, and half of them are made by another company, which is Heineken. And part of why they make all those beers isn't that they invented all of those different types of beers. They bought up other smaller companies, many of which did invent those. They keep the branding, they keep the name, um, and the like. And you see this happening increasingly um, throughout the economy. You can't just end with that observation. Because as a general matter, when you see increased concentration, a smaller number of firms in any given industry, whether it's making beer, making washing machines, selling fertilizer to farmers, air travel, um, and the like, there's two different things that it could mean. Um, it could mean that you have more competition. A new successful company comes in. It's efficient. It innovates. It drives smaller businesses out. You end up with an equilibrium with a smaller number of firms, but that's a good thing, not a bad thing. Um, it could also mean um, less competition. You got there with a merger maybe that shouldn't have been allowed, a barrier to entry when you erect a legal one or the like. It could be either one of these two. There's not one story that works for the entire economy. And um, you, know, you could have you know, more competition, like superstar firms, globalization. Um, you could have bad things, like reductions in mergers, increased regulatory barriers, um, and the like. So how can we tell the difference between them? In some ways, the comparison of retail and healthcare is really instructive in this regard. This is based on research by Cruze, Nicholas Cruze and Jan Eberle at Northwestern. And they looked at retail and healthcare. In both sectors, you saw similar increases in concentration. You saw a lot of hospital mergers. You saw a lot of um, retail stores replace smaller ones. But you saw two very different things. If you looked at markups, markups rose a lot in healthcare and actually fell slightly in retail. At the same time, efficiency rose quite a lot in retail. So the combination of rising efficiency and falling markups meant retail fight prices fell quite a lot, which is how companies like Walmart grew, um, as opposed to healthcare, where at least measures of efficiency, and it's a tricky thing to measure, didn't go up in anything the same regard. So I would view retail as an example of good competition, healthcare as a pretty classic example of um, bad, um, reduction, bad increase in concentration or reduction in competition. I want to just briefly give an orientation towards competition policy before plunging into the tech sector itself and say that there's sort of roughly three schools of thought. Um, one school of thought are the original Brandeis and the neo Brandeisian, so that's Lena Kahn and Tim Wu. Their perspective is to some degree that big is bad inherently, that you don't want to determine the goodness or badness of big by analyzing consumer welfare. You want to look at a broader set of considerations, like what it means for the political system, what it means for local stores, what it means for the community, um, and the like. And that the decades of economists running dueling studies and fighting about them in courts should be over, replaced by a simpler set of criteria. That's one view. The sort of the original way people thought about it 100 years ago, it's starting to come back in some circles. Um, there's a second school, the Chicago School of Work, and somebody named Josh Wright, who is an FTC commissioner, that said, no, let's actually do economic analysis. Let's not focus on big inherently being bad. Let's look at what this means. Is it efficient in generating benefits for consumers? 
or is it abusive and high prices and hurting consumers? That was one thing the Chicago School thought. The second thing, to be really crude and overstate the case, is, by the way, almost everything is good for consumers. We care about consumers, and if you do a simple economic model, don't worry, um, unless it's a cartel or outright illegal collusion, um, they're going to be fine. There's a third group, which is where I'm coming from a little bit more. That's Carl Shapiro from around here. Fiona Scott Morton, Jonathan Baker has a book. Um, they don't really have a name. Maybe they're the Yale School. Maybe they could be the Berkeley School. I don't know, Cal, if that's um, OK or not. And they have the view that let's look at consumer welfare. Let's not try to do broader things with antitrust. Let's look at it through the prism of economics and economic analysis. But let's be careful with that economic analysis and do the type of thing that I was just going through. Is it helping consumers? Is it hurting consumers? What's happening? Um, and the like. And it turns out that we don't want to be nearly quite as, as, as lax and relaxed about what matters. So with this background, you know, talking about beer, talking about hospitals, talking about retail, talking about these, this general orientation, um, what does it mean for Google, Facebook, Amazon, and some of the other companies in this sector? In many ways, they have a lot of the characteristics that I talked about in retail. A lot of the growth is really innovative, enormous benefits to consumers from that growth, and replaced in many ways smaller, less efficient companies. But there's also a lot in common with hospitals, a lot of the growth of the companies has been mergers, not the type of organic growth that you see in something like Walmart. A lot of it has been various forms of barriers to entry that make it potentially hard for another business to come in, and have the characteristics that might make us more concerned about um, that growth in concentration. So in many ways, I think this is quite a tricky problem um, to deal with. You have things that are good that you don't want to mess up. And um, you have things that I think could be a lot better if you got policy right. So I used to give a talk a little bit like the one I just did. And I would end where I just did and get a question, what should be done? And my answer would be, I don't know. And I had lunch with the Chancellor of the Exchequer, um, Phil ha the then Chancellor of the Exchequer, Phil Hammond. And we were talking about these topics. And he invited me to chair an expert panel. I told him I didn't know what the expert panel should find. And he thought that was a good qualification um, for doing it. Um, this was the panel. We had a lawyer, a technologist, an IO economist who specialized in this area, um, and someone else. Over about a nine month period, we took a lot of evidence from a lot of people. We had over 60 submissions, um, a lot of different meetings. And at the end of that process, came out with this report called Unlocking Digital Competition. And that's what I want to share with you. It was a report for the UK, but part of the goal of this report was to spark a global dialogue around the issue. Most of the ideas are applicable in a range of countries. And you've seen places like Australia um, embrace a number of the recommendations. And people here are discussing them as well. We started with, or I start with, a number of different questions. And I think different people have different answers to these questions. And that's why they come out in different places in policy. And I'll go through these four questions. Um, the first one is, is competition in the digital sector beneficial? The answer is not obvious. These are two types of people that are using digital platforms. Um, this one is shopping for his children's birthday. And that one's planning a terrorist attack. People use platforms for all sorts of things. Competition policy is very well suited at making things better for what consumers want. If we think what they want is valid, then competition policy can is potentially a great tool. What they want is information about how to carry out a terrorist attack or a means of organizing genocide or child pornography, then competition isn't the right tool to um, 
you know, to help with those problems. In fact, if anything, there's a chance it could exacerbate them. And I think this is important because you see people who are centered around competition and think, you know, these companies have done all these terrible things. They have fake news and they ruined the last election and I hate them. And so we should just break them up and we'll get less of all of that bad stuff. And that's a little bit like the carpenter for whom, you know, has a hammer and everything looks like a nail. And competition is very good at the things when we like what consumers like. A lot of the complaints people have are complaints around things like content that I don't think that competition um, will help. So what's your problem? Is it something that consumers value, competition good? Is it not? We need some other form of regulation or some other way of getting at it. Um, second, is competition in the digital sector absent? We're um, generally a lot of familiar with the set of factors like network externalities. It benefits me to be on a social network other people are on. Economies of scale and scope, products that essentially have near zero marginal cost. The fact that data is essential to forming um, a lot of these products and it can be a barrier to entry. Um, capital and brands can matter, especially when intangibles that are hard to borrow against. Um, and behavioral features of consumers who could switch um, that don't switch. A lot of these happen in many different markets. They're quite severe in the digital market. They all happen at once. They happen together. And what they tend to lead to is markets that tip towards a winner take all or a winner take most. Um, this is one of the exhibits from our report, and it's just for the UK, but it looks at the combined share of the top two, country, two companies in a number of different sectors like a uh, number of different activities, online search, digital advertising, mobile operating systems, um, social media. We could broaden this out and in a lot of the different activities, whether it's email, cloud computing, office productivity, and the like, there are two dominant competitors. Many of these, it's been impossible for a third to get a foothold. Google has a lot of data, has a lot of ability. It tried to set up a social network um, for about eight years or so, the social network was in existence and was widely used by people that worked at Google. And then it ceased um, to exist. Microsoft had a quite good mobile operating system, but no one wanted to write apps for three different mobile operating systems. So you know, if you wrote an app for Apple, you paid Apple. If you wrote an app for Microsoft and you were a major company, they might even pay you. Um, to write that app. That was just a market where even a big, successful, deep-pocketed company had a hard time entering because of all of these features. I think the trickier question, and the one that, frankly, I'm less sure of than the market share that we've just been talking about, is the distinction between competition in the market, is there more than one at a time, and competition for the market. You have the example of you know, MySpace, which was the dominant social network until Facebook was the dominant social network. Yahoo, the dominant search engine, and I think for like two minutes, Alta Vista and Lycos, and Google today. Are these, you know, and since our report, TikTok has exploded um, and emerged. Is it that five years from now, somebody from maybe even Harvard will come up with a better search algorithm than those Stanford people did? And you know, you'll have a new search engine. Or is the fact that Google has been that dominant search engine for 20 years means that the MySpace example, with each passing year, becomes one year less relevant and one year less plausible um, than it used to be? There's a number of reasons to think that competition for the market could be quite difficult, where a new entrant overthrows them, whether it's the, all the features that I was talking about um, before, but also the fact that if you have spot a competitor, you're quite aware of what happened to MySpace, and you might want to buy them up and incorporate them before they can grow up and compete against you. So I'm not positive that um, you know, there's no competition for the market, but I'm worried. So no, probably not. Is lack of competition costly? Products are free. Products are wonderful. Everyone loves the products. Why is anyone whining about all of this? 
I think there are a number of costs that one would need to worry about. Um, one, that as a sort of stealing a line from Fiona Scott Morden, zero is just another number. Maybe the equilibrium price for some of these activities would be negative. Negative means you could be paid to use the product, or you could get a better set of features for free when you use the product. If you think advertising prices are higher than they otherwise would have been, so I'm not saying our digital advertising price is higher than prices before all this innovation. I'm saying with all this innovation plus competition, prices, if you think they'd be lower than with all this innovation with less competition, um, then those markups are showing up somewhere. You know, if, if you do something to drive up the price of steel, I personally have never bought steel. Um, but I've bought a lot of things with steel, and if somebody makes the price of steel go up, they're making the things I buy go up. Um, you potentially pay in terms of data and privacy. I have a friend on Facebook, or at least he used to be on Facebook, and he decided he just really didn't like the company at all anymore and wrote a long piece. Um, in his case, a lot of it was the genocide in Myanmar. Terrible company. They abetted this. I'm not ever going to be on Facebook. I'm deleting my account. From now on, you can follow me on Instagram. Um, that was literally his Facebook post. I could name him for anyone who wants to talk to me afterwards. He wrote exactly that. Several people in the comments pointed out some of this irony associated with this. And he said he knew he wanted to be on something else that wasn't a Facebook product, but the three main social networking, ways of social networking. Facebook, Instagram, um, and, and um, uh, WhatsApp, thank you. Um, what's wrong with me? WhatsApp. Uh, they all, they all. Um, lost quality and variety. That's a standard consumer issue. And finally, innovation. Um, we, I think we always have to worry when there's too much concentration about what that can do to innovation. The last question is another one that I don't feel I have 100% confidence on. I think different people that have different views on policy come to different conclusions on that, which is, can there be competition in the digital sector? I gave you this really, hopefully, completely persuasive list about network externalities and zero marginal cost and the importance of brands and intangibles and behavior, et cetera. If you take that too seriously, you might think no one could ever enter. And competition's impossible. I think that, in part, that chance that's true. And we could do all the policy steps in the world and discover it's exactly the same companies doing the same sets of activities, dividing them up in similar ways 10 years from now. Uh, but I think part of the lack of competition is reflected choices, which I'll get into, choices around technologies to use, about interoperability about whether to allow a company to acquire another company um, and the like. You know, part of this is just you know, these sets of um, acquisitions. Um, there have been hundreds, over, well, over 400 acquisitions by major platforms. A lot of those are really small. Most of those are probably fine. Consumers benefit a lot from being able to integrate a set of features, improve on those set of features, and take something that a given company was too small to deploy on a large scale um, and doing it. So I don't think we want to lose any of that. But I think in terms of the balance of those sets of benefits associated with acquisitions and the concern not just about competition in the present, but at what it means for future competition, I think we might have gotten the balance wrong in that we've basically allowed every one of these mergers. Maybe one of these was a mistake, maybe two, maybe three. I don't know. I guess Fitbit hasn't been allowed yet. And um, I'm not sure, and maybe someone can give me an example, of an example where a merger was denied or seriously deterred because of fear of enforcement. So if you think enforcement makes type 1 errors and type 2 errors, or false positives, false negatives, um, we may have had some false positives where we stopped something, uh, where we allowed something that we shouldn't have done. We've had no false negatives where we stopped something that we should have allowed. 
Um, plus, it's also a little bit more reversible. Once you allow a merger, you can't undo it. If you make a mistake and you stop two companies from merging, a couple of years later, they can come back and try it again, um, CT Mobile, Sprint. So to summarize these questions, is competition beneficial? If you think the answer is no, you're in a regulatory world that has nothing to do with competition. If you think the answer is yes, or at least yes in enough places, then the next question you want to ask is, you know, is it absent? And is that absence costly? If your answer to that is yes, you then want to ask, is competition policy effective? And depending on your answers to these different questions, I sort of do yes. Mostly, yes, probably. I get to a pro-competition policy. You could also decide you're going to give up on competition policy and do utility regulation. You could think there's no problem and do no policy change. Or you could think competition isn't the answer and you need to regulate content to the degree that's allowed in your country. In this country, it's barely allowed. And that's, that's a good thing about this country. Um, or regulate privacy or something like that. So that's a lot of motivation. And I think it's important, though, because I think this good and bad parts of competition is an important idea. I think understanding you know, where it can work, where it can't, what motivates it. In terms of our recommendations, um, the first recommendation was tougher um, merger enforcement. It was for the UK to update the guidelines it uses to assess mergers, to put greater weight on potential competition in the future, not just what the situation is today. And to look more broadly, not just at prices, but the effects especially on innovation. In the context of the United States, I think that could be done and implemented by reversing presumptions. There's a lot of grayness in everything I just said. In the face of all that grayness, if you're not sure which side wins, and change it from rather than the government needs to prove that the merger is a problem, in the case of platform acquisitions that the platform would need to prove that the merger was a good idea. My guess is 95% of the past mergers, maybe more, would have had no problem at all to prove why they were a great thing. It's a small company. This is an aqua hire. This is a feature that we can bolt onto our product and make our product much better that couldn't have existed on its own. I think there's an awful lot of that. But I think some things probably would fail a tougher test. Tougher antitrust enforcement, I won't say very much about, because our recommendations in the UK were pretty technical and UK specific. And I actually am not sure there is a lot of scope um, for that. Antitrust is a very lengthy process. It's a very uncertain process. You can come out of it with a wonderful headline of the billion dollar penalty that you just won without any attention to the remedies um, around conduct or deterrent effect because it's about a very particular type of behavior and doesn't apply in general as much. Those limitations of antitrust is why our core recommendation was this third one, to establish a pro-competition digital regulator. In the context of the UK, we called it a um, digital markets unit. It could be a new standalone body. It could be in an existing body. In the United States, you could imagine this being a division within the Federal Trade Commission you could imagine some new entity that gets this set of responsibilities. And the set of responsibilities include, um, number one, a code of conduct. We'll talk more about in a second. Number two, data mobility and open standards. And the third function is data openness. The three activities that we would want this regulator to do, all with an eye to make it easier for others to enter while maintaining the ability um, to continue to innovate and grow. Part of this is basically agnostic on what the right number of companies is, whether it's you know, one or 30, but saying let's level the playing field as much as possible and then let the market decide rather than imposing some top-down view on the question. The code of conduct is large would apply to businesses with strategic market status, essentially bottleneck or gateway companies on platform. There'd be a designation process that would pick what those companies were. The designation would last for five years, at which point it would be reevaluated. 
a little bit like the SIFI designation that's done by FSAC, or in the UK, the significant market power designation that's done by Ofcom. If you're a medium or small business, these wouldn't apply to you. You could behave in whatever way you wanted. If you were one of the businesses with strategic market status, you would have a set of, sort of neutrality principles. Um, you'd have to allow others access to designated platforms on a fair, consistent, and transparent basis. You'd have to make sure things like shopping were also done in that same way. And you can't unfairly restrict people from being on your platform, stop them from being on other platforms. A lot of the platforms say this is what they're doing right now. I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of them are somewhat close to doing all of this. In which case, what this would be is spelling out in more detail a set of obligations, many of them under existing antitrust law, fleshed out in a more collaborative way through a code of conduct with more ex ante clarity around it and enforcement power in this agency um, through fining. It would deter a set of actions. And insofar as there were things, the hope would be to get at it more quickly rather than through the types of 12-year antitrust cases at the end of which the entire market and everyone has moved on and gone beyond that. So that's the first idea. The second is data mobility and open standards. The premise of this is that some of what I was talking about with the network externalities and the like aren't a natural feature of the world. It's an actual property of physics that to get water to someone's house, you need a pipe that's under the ground, and that it's quite expensive to dig under the ground, and to have two pipes running into everyone's house so they would have competition for who provided them water would be a pretty stupid way to bring down the price of water for people. And so we just regulate um, the price of water. The degree to which different platforms interoperate is not the same type of physical law, and in some refle senses reflects a choice. So email has a set of standards. They were standards that were developed in a public, nonprofit manner. And as a result, there's no network externalities associated with email. I don't have to worry when I want to email Mark, is he using the same email program as mine, and can our email system speak to each other? I don't care what email system he's using. I don't care what email client he's using, because we can all speak to each other over that. And that reflects a technological choice that there's no network externalities in email. There are network externalities in messaging and social networking. Having a regulator that can come in and taking into account issues like privacy, taking into account issues like technology, figuring out how to have more of that interoperability, more ability for people to multi-home on different systems, to switch systems, is a way of injecting more competition. Something that the platforms to some degree are doing because it's in their interest. To some degree they're doing maybe because they're afraid and want to forestall regulation. But I don't think their interests are fully aligned with the interests of competition. And so more of an impetus towards that would be helpful. The final recommendation was data openness. And I'm going to spend less time talking about this, because this one was a little bit um, of a really good idea if anyone else could figure out how to do it. And we didn't get all the way to figuring out how data openness works. But it might be with something like autonomous vehicles. The data collected by different companies becomes more generally um, available and less of a barrier um, to entry. So those three, in terms of the regulator, code of conduct, um, data mobility and open standards, and data openness. So what's going on now? There's a big, vibrant global con conversation about this topic. Um, the FTC has held hearings. The Judiciary Committee has. There's been enforcement actions. There's been legislation um, introduced in Congress, all of this in the United States. Everything in the United States always takes longer to do than you could possibly imagine. Trust me, I've observed a lot of it very closely, like paint drying. Um, and there's been a robust global conversation. I was at the G7 finance ministers this past summer and presented to the finance ministers as heads of central banks. 
um, these recommendations. The OECD has done reports. The European Commission has done reports. The Australians um, did one. The Germans have. The French are working on one. And at the end of the day, I think the right way to do this um, certainly isn't global regulation. That such a thing is impossible. But it would be some convergence. A little bit like we have actually on merger policy now, where you have bodies ideally in as big a unit as possible, like the European Union, the United States, doing this, doing this in a similar way. If you could meet the test for one of them, that means you could meet the test for all of them. And that's why having this global conversation now and figuring out how to get this right is so important, because I think there's so many different ways that we could also um, get it wrong. So thank you, and look forward to our discussion. So uh, yeah, I, I, I'm excited that antitrust has come to your vision. It's also come in the public a lot. I'm uh, not uh, quite as uh, uh, optimistic of that people really care about competition as much as you and I do now. Uh, but they care about, for example, in a lot yeah. of these, what? They, they, they care about mm. privacy. You know, these thing, companies are doing bad things to me. But it's, it's, it's a question of, I think a lot of people care, is, this, is, is my data private? Are, are they spying on me? Does my Amazon Alexa tell all of a sudden now I have uh, ads showing up on Facebook when I was talking in my house? Uh, how do you find sort of this antitrust exercise you've done appealing to more people and also thinking about how does it affect people's privacy? Is breaking up, pe breaking up firms a good thing for privacy or a bad thing for privacy? Right. So this gets back to the idea that competition policy is good at things consumers care about and bad at things that we as a society care about but may not be valued or understood by consumers. And I think privacy is a bit in both of those categories. It is something consumers care about. And I think, you know, look at the way Apple advertises um, the iPhone. And they've made privacy a really big part of the way that they market the iPhone. And you know, if there was only one phone company, we wouldn't have that. So having that, those types of choices with social networks, and insofar as it's something people value, having more choices, and having ways to make them aware of what those choices mean will, I think, help with privacy. So I think for the most part, this is complementary. Um, it's probably not sufficient. In Europe, they certainly think of privacy from a human rights perspective, which isn't like you have the right to sell your privacy in exchange for money. I'm a little bit more, as long as it's eyes wide open and you know what you're doing, you know, have the free version with less privacy and the paid version with more privacy, and you can decide you know, what you care more about, money or, or your privacy. And do you think there's consumers are aware enough of what does privacy mean, what are they doing with their data, and that sort of thing? I, is, or is there a need for, on your thing, some regulation as well on privacy issues? I mean, one view is revealed preference, that one reason people aren't that aware is that they don't actually care as much as they think they care. I think that's mm -hmm. perfectly plausible. That certainly describes me. Um, but the fact that Apple runs an awful lot of ads on privacy means that at least their clientele, not exactly the representative American, um, they think cares about that issue and they think is likely to spend more money and buy their product instead of someone else's because of that. So I think a market, the market can play a role in that, but probably won't be enough. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit. <coughs> sort of in antitrust, uh, we tend to think a lot about horizontal mergers and vertical mergers. In fact, the DOJ and FTC just came out with recent vertical merger guidelines. Uh, for most people thinking about vertical and horizontal, uh, AT&T bought Time Warner. AT&T was a distribution company. Time Warner is a content company. And the Justice Department challenged that merger. And uh, Carl Shapiro, who was on the side, was the expert witness for the government. And the government lost that in court as a vertical merger. And as a, hor a horizontal merger, uh, the uh, T-Mobile Sprint merger that's now being challenged by the state attorneys general and Carl Shapiro and Fiona Scott <laughs> Morton are the expert witnesses for the states challenging that merger sort of as a uh, horizontal merger. The U.S. has uh, treated the, usually this was the first vertical merger challenge in a long time, the AT&T Time Warner. The 
European Union has a somewhat different view of vertical relationships and vertical antitrust. Uh, Google's Android system uh, has been, they've been fined for what they've been doing with Android and other things in vertical relationships, whereas the US has been less uh, pushing on that. How does your framework, where you, at least as far as I could tell, didn't mention horizontal, vertical in any way that a typical antitrust practitioner in the US would worry about these things? Play in that. Yeah. I think the idea that all vertical mergers or the efficiency benefits outweigh any competitive harm has gone way too far in a lot of different respects. So I was you know, sympathetic with the government's case and Carl Shapiro's arguments um, for the government's case. So the guidelines I was talking about would apply um, this set of considerations in both a vertical um, and a horizontal context, where you're asking what it does to the ecosystem, what it does to somebody, you know, a company that might become a competitor in the future, even if it is now. Um, part of it is, you know, in the platform space, there's more malleability about sort of where you are and how your product changes and evolves over time. So the distinctions can be a little bit the vertical, horizontal can be a little bit less clear. But yeah, I think we went way too far. And the court, unfortunately, reflects the way too far part, not the correction to that. Uh, but you think that the European Union is kind of on the right track in pushing on vertical relationships? I, in general, think the more assertive approach by the commission um, in general has been, I think, has been quite welcome. And just to say something, I'm 100% convinced that they have a different philosophy than the United States and think it has very little to do with nationality. There's a lot of people who think, oh, they're only tough on US companies. You know, look at Siemens Alstom. I mean, that's a horizontal, not a vertical. Um, they went against the entire political establishment of Germany and France um, in blocking that merger. So you might think they're wrong and too aggressive in their antitrust enforcement, um, but that is a sort of equal opportunity. I don't think that's some veiled nationalism. Um, now, when it comes to taxes, we could talk about <laughs> a different topic. Uh, we'll leave that for the audience questions if they want to ask you about taxes. Um, uh, so this is, um, you talked about uh, burden shifting. And in, the, in, the, uh, in my class earlier today, you talked about the consumer welfare standard. And is that how you would think that they need to show the consumer welfare increases as a positive showing? I think that it may, you know, oftentimes there's a large gray area of what can you can you show a negative or not show this uh, in terms of uh, how how hard is it to show that the uh, when the burden shifts can you show that consumer welfare is going to go up? Well, all these firms when they come in for a merger they have these uh, uh, efficiencies arguments of here's why this merger is so good. How how is the burden shifting going to you know, push things and are there going to be problems with it? Yeah, so every, everything I talked about matters to consumers. Prices matter, quality, variety, innovation. All of those have been used in merger assessment in the past. And some sectors like aerospace used quite a lot and became almost routinized for acquisitions. Innovation was there. The issue is the further you move away from the current static analysis of price, and into two-sided markets, and this side is free, and what happens on the other side, and would the product have evolved? You know, is Instagram, you know, it has 50 million users now, but could it grow up? Instagram doesn't have a lot of the features of Facebook, but could it change its features? All of those, you take something that was already dueling experts and having a decent amount of gray, you know, what happens to gasoline prices when two gas stations merge, and you're adding a whole lot more gray which is why the law has established, you know, in some cases, you know, things that are per se illegal. You, know, you can't call up another company and tell them you're not going to hire their software engineers and vice versa. And putting that in email is particularly unwise. Um, but it's also um, established a set of rebuttable presumptions. You sort of start with this, and someone can rebut it. And using that, rather than having to prove everything from scratch, but start out from Here's where we start. Here's what we think is probably the case. And now, you know, let's look at the facts in this particular thing and see if we can move it off that. So I think you know, your null hypothesis matters an awful lot um, the, more, the more gray everything is. I should mention that in the 
you know, during the AT&T T-Mobile merger in 2010-11, the Department of Justice had the burden to show that it was an anti-competitive merger. The Federal Communications Commission, the companies have the burden to show that it's in the public interest. So try, and it was uh, AT&T Time Warner realized this, and they sold off one television station that they had so they would avoid having to go to the FCC where the burden was the other way around. Um, so that was an interesting. How easier to navigate often. Yeah. So when you were able to sell one TV station, it was easier than, than T-Mobile and Sprint not having to do that. Um, so uh, another important feature that you talk about, I think, a lot is uh, innovation you know, and, and how to think about future innovation and uh, you know, how, how would this, uh, how would your proposal, so in, in antitrust in the US, there were, there were innovation markets considered in Barra Monsanto and Dow DuPont and other, other cases. Uh, I'm just trying to think, are you thinking just that we need to think further out in these uh, discussions? The, the, the merger guidelines now talk about what happens in the next two years. Yeah, no, this is definitely for, this has to be further out, and that's where the potential competition has to be further out. And that's where more grayness creeps in, and that's where some determination about what you're going to do in the gray zone and how you're going to judge it um, becomes more important. Mm -hmm. I mean, would you think, is, is, I mean, two years especially, it seems like it's a pretty short window for worrying about things, but on the other hand, the further out you go, the, the much, yeah, much more uncertainty there is. Do you yeah, have a, and I think you, you're going to make mistakes. Let's be clear. You are going to, if you did what I said, there will be a merger that would have been good for the world that will end up getting blocked. There will also be errors in the other direction, mergers that are bad for the world that will be allowed to go forward. And you're trying to balance those two types of errors. And my statement is that we've done a terrible job of balancing those two types of errors to date. We've made all of one type of the error and none of the other type of the error. And you know, to have them happening in both directions, I think, is unfortunately an area that is inherently really, really uncertain matter. Second thing I'd say also is, what's the, co you know, what's the cost of making an error? Part depends on how easy it is to reverse the error. And as I was saying before, if you allow a merger that you shouldn't have, you can't ever come back and undo it effectively. If you disallow a merger, yes, you're causing a problem, a bit of you know, inefficiency for a couple of years, but you can always um, come back. And so that asymmetry in the reversibility is another reason why, if anything, you'd want to make a few more errors and worry a little bit less about falsely blocking a merger you shouldn't have. And again, I'm not advocating that. I'd, I'd love to say this will be perfect, and all the bad things will be stopped, and all the good things will go forward. But the uncertainty, we have to be honest about it, not that we're going to make errors, and then figure out how we want to balance those errors. Great. So I'm going to go to the audience for questions. Uh, if you raise your hand, and, and then they'll come with a microphone and identify yourself. We'll start back there. And just while, before, you, before you do the one thing, just on this error cost analysis, and in the book that he had up there by John Baker, talks a lot about the error cost analysis that, he, that Jason was articulating there. Uh, Dixon Dahl, a member of the uh, proud member of the uh, advisory board here. Uh, sorry, I got here late, but question is: Is there any relevance of horizontal and uh, vertical uh, mergers in the TMT industry? The way technology is changing so rapidly. A kind of a second sub question is: um, Any opinions on whether the uh, T-Mobile and Sprint merger either could or should? Go through. TMT technology, media, and technology. Oh, 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 media okay. and right. technology. The broad media design. Yeah. So, and that was about horizontal and vertical mergers in that sector. So, yes, I mean, I think AT and T, Time Warner um, makes me nervous um, as a merger. You've seen, you know, AT and T said it was not going to do certain things in terms of the content. It's already starting to do some of them, that you know, they could prioritize their content, keep other people's out, make it difficult to have the rich variety of content and rich set of ways to get to people, um, makes me nervous. On, um, 
what's wrong with me? Your second question. Oh, 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 oh uh, Sprint T-Mobile. Yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah. So AT&T T-Mobile, I thought, was obscene, the idea that they would merge. That the Justice Department stopped them, I was not involved with at all. In the White House, you don't get involved in particular matters. But the fact that you got the unlimited plan price war broke out after that, and that T-Mobile really continued to thrive, I think, was a complete vindication of that decision. So I think when the number one is trying to merge with the number four, to say no is quite obvious. When three and four are merging, and number four you know, may or may not be economically viable, um, I don't have a great degree of confidence without having gone through all of it. I tend to be on the side of the experts I trust, like Carl Shapiro and Fiona Scott Morton, and the state attorneys general that are trying to block that merger. But you know, someone asked me to sign a letter on it, and I didn't want to sign the letter because I didn't feel like I had the first-hand knowledge to be confident enough to sign. Thank you. Um, on the binary choice of block or not block, of course, a lot of the negotiations are about curative divestitures. They seem to work better when uh, a, uh, an industry is territory specific and right. maybe not as effective in, this, uh, in the digital uh, context. And I wondered if that was a further argument for, for some of the proposals from your expert panel. Um, but it, how, do, how do curative divestitures work, if at all, in a digital? Uh, right. Yeah, you just answered your question, um, <laughs> which is if it's gas stations merging, you, they have done that. Like, and they go through, like, hey, in this place, in that place, you have to sell your, your gas stations. Um, there's not really an analog to that here. And I think, in general, um, the antitrust enforcers have been a bit too timid about just saying, you know what, we're not going to allow this to go forward. So uh, that's why I was happy to see something like Siemens Alstom, where they're willing just to not try to tinker around the edges, but go directly at it. But I don't, yeah. yeah I mean, I, yes, of course, there's things between 0 and 1, even in the tech sector. But I think in a lot of cases, maybe zero or one is, is, is better. Question there. Hi, um, I'm Betsy. I'm a sophomore. Um, I was wondering if in your report you came to any conclusions about what should be done about the effect that social media networks have had on traditional journalism and the decline of competition and quality reporting, especially. Um, I feel like people are mad about fake news, but the decline in quality reporting is something that isn't talked about as much in conjunction with that. So I was wondering if you had anything to say about it. Yeah. So when we were doing our report, they were UK government was undertaking um, another review of precisely that question that was going on in parallel to ours. So we, in sort of division of labor, didn't address that issue. And I'm not sure I could give you a great answer as to whether if you did everything I said, you know, to tell you sort of why that would bring back local newspapers or, or something like that. And I think the decline of local newspapers is sort of a sad, terrible fact for our democracy. But it might fall under the heading of, you know, it's not the thing that this particular hammer um, should be looking at in terms of a nail. Great. We have more students? OK. Yeah, nice. Hi, my name is Jessica. And I'm also I'm a freshman here at Stanford. Um, I was wondering about um, the right now WeChat in China is the digital giant in the country. So I was wondering about the role of competition in maybe like a smaller market like China, and if maybe government regulation might lead to um, an increased frequency of increased concentration being a good thing when it comes to competition? Sure. Um, that's a great question. So um, first of all, China definitely does not do competition policy in a nationally neutral manner. I'm not going to defend them <laughs> um, in, in that regard. I think China, in some respects, has a quite different economic model um, than the United States. They, you know, A system of national champions of government support for them, in some cases, um, you know, in some sectors, that's subsidized power and credit. In other sectors, might be you know, um, you know, building local clusters and the like, which has a little bit more of an analog here. I think it's possible China can do all of that. 
I don't think that's something the United States can do well. Even if we could do it well, I'm not sure it should be done. And so I think the way that we have been super successful at innovating in the United States is through competition, is through a vibrant startup ecosystem. You know, one way you have a vibrant startup ecosystem is that you know you have an exit plan, which might be being acquired by one of the major platforms. But I think you want part of that vibrant ecosystem to sort of exist outside that kill zone and be um, supported by things other than just the platforms and might be trying to figure out ways to compete with the platforms rather than being acquired by them. So I think that this is sort of a, you know, to some degree, if I want to frame it as a competitive strategy that you know, China has its way of succeeding, our way of succeeding is more competition. That's how we're going to have more innovation and compete better. I could recast that in that, in that frame. I think we have time for one more quick question. Or wait, wait, you got to wait for the microphone. Uh, one other dimension of competition to look at is the competition between countries. And when you look at uh, Europe, they've had very few mega companies get to new companies in the past 50 years. They're hard to even identify. Uh, whereas in the US, we saw the emergence of many digital companies. In fact, the largest market cap companies in the US, for the most part, were created in the last 50 years. So if you uh, make it difficult for these mega companies to exist because of competition, you prevent the US from having the companies that dominate the global industries in that case. So you look at Europe has, uh, an example you were talking about before was about the, I think the railroad, uh, the train companies? Yep. Okay, so essentially uh, Europe is shooting itself in the foot because from a European perspective, it was good from a competition point of view. But what's going to happen over the next 20 years, they're going to be an irrelevant or dead entity in the world railroad uh, manufacturing because they're not large enough to compete on, on the global scale, and they're just going to not succeed. So one important dimension for national policy should be uh, what does this do towards country-to-country uh, -to -country competitiveness? Because I think overall the U.S. benefited tremendously by those companies that are so dominant in digital. So I think I half agree with you. I'd rather those companies be here than be someplace else. And I think we should have a set of policies that fosters um, and makes that possible. I don't think antitrust enforcement is one of the top three or four reasons that people that study the European economy and ask why they don't have big companies have given for it. Part of it is they have a bunch of smaller countries that are still only slowly knitting themselves together as a single market and haven't done so yet in terms of being a single capital market or a single um, digital market. And so if I had to list my top two for Europe, it would be the capital market um, and the lack of a single digital market. Not that there was, you know, it wasn't like there was a medium sized digital platform that one in Germany, one in France, and they were prevented from merging. So I think. Um, there's a lot of problems with Europe, but you don't want to use that to argue against um, everything here. And the second thing is, to some degree, the same as the answer vis-a-vis -vis China. I think that having disrupt more disruptive innovation is a good thing. And that's where a lot of these huge companies came from. And a bit more of a level playing field, both in terms of conduct and in terms of interoperability, I think would enable um, more disruptive innovation and make it more likely that we have the next big company here rather than um, being beaten by a competitor elsewhere. Great. Well, thank you very much, Jason. That was great. Okay. Yeah.